we're getting ready to turn the program over to Anna Patterson, our Executive Director. Among the things that Anna is going to talk to you about today are PLS achievements since the last annual members meeting. And I want to take the prerogative of the president and say that the board firmly believes that having Anna as our first executive director for the last year and a quarter is one of PLF's biggest successes. And I hope you are. Thank you very much. So, um, as Kit said, my name is Anna Patterson. I've had the privilege of working uh, with the Point Lobos Foundation for, on behalf of one of the most significant resources in the state for about six years now, um, serving as the executive director for the last year. And I'm really grateful to have the time this morning to highlight some of our collective accomplishments. And, and I want to stress collective because uh, while this is a PLF annual meeting, our work is really only possible with the support of our partners at the Monterey District of California State Parks, the incredible work of, of the Dozen Organization, the PLF uh, Board of Directors, committee members, and all of our staff. So, so we're talking about PLF's accomplishments today, but they really are shared. And most um, also very critically in there is the help of our supporters, by which none of this would actually happen. <clears throat> so we are very excited to hear from Jonathan Jarvis today, happy that he's here, um, and we have some really special awards happening later, so I want to include um, a little, a few bits of general information. We have some fabulous photos that are included in this presentation taken by volunteers, supporters, donors, docents, and state parks, and I, I don't have the time to acknowledge everybody, but I want to recognize collectively um, the, the skilled photographers that we have in this world of Point Lobos. So we are gonna go through things pretty quickly and I wanted to make sure that you know that there's more opportunities for input, for questions, for suggestions. So today um, we're gonna do a, a little bit of a panel style after the meeting where Kenley Butler, myself, Ken Armstrong, uh, Brent, if he's able to stay, Sean James will be up to answer any questions. And then we have a collection box in the front. So um, some of you may prefer to ask questions or make suggestions anonymously. Feel free, you can write those down if you have to leave early. If you would like an answer to a question, please do include your name and how we can reach you or else we won't be able to provide that. And then um, we have a, a lot of information available online for members, so things like our bylaws, our articles of incorporation, our annual member meeting minutes, our um, a nomination form for the Point Lobos Foundation Board of Directors. And all of that is available at information-members on the Point Lobos Foundation site. And then we're here five days a week, every week, so I'd encourage you to call if you have questions or suggestions, and um, we have business cards out at the front for anybody who, who would like to take one after the meeting. So we made some changes to the, the program this year, and we moved the annual meeting into spring, and that's really because this serves almost as an annual report for the organization, and we wanted to be able to provide some financial information to you. So we have um, several new things this year. We have this graphic called By the Numbers that, that really shows, um, shows expenses by program area, um, we're having some technical, pardon me, some technical issues. There, got it? <laughs> um, by program area percentage of total expenses and the dollar amount that we've spent in each of the areas. We have a page highlighting the organization's vision and strategic goals. So in, in 2018, we worked hard to complete a vision and strategic plan for 2019 to 2023. And then lastly, we have some unaudited financials. So I'm gonna report on achievements here um, following the by the numbers graphic. And so we're talking about 2018. I wanna start with trails and infrastructure. So we um, continued our support of facilities improvements and maintenance in the reserve. One, one of the things that had happened in the restrooms were that a lot of the mirrors were cracked and chipped and we replaced all of the mirrors with scratch-free, high-quality mirrors throughout the reserve. 
We continued the support of the facilities like the docent center, the information station, and things like that. We provided financial support for two full-time trail crew members, so we expanded the district trail crew by two people, which expanded services at Point Lobos. And then we supported two trail volunteer work days that were led by state parks and had over 100 hours of service provided through those work days. One of those days um, involved, I know many of you will remember, the tree that fell and blocked the entrance to the pit along the Granite Point Trail. And so one of these work days involved the state parks crew chopping up the tree, volunteers coming out and removing the debris and restoring the view for um, visitors to this beautiful area. So moving on to natural resource protection. This is a, a, a big area for the organization. And this image is of the Neighborhood Youth Association High School Leadership Program. They're based out of Southern California and they came out with the support of the ecologists to do some weed work in Hudson Meadows. So, our restoration ecologist who is here today, and I'm not sure where she is, Anna B. Oh, <laughs> you have to raise your hand higher. <laughs> um, has done some really tremendous work over the years. So she's developed a core group of, um, of regular, primarily docent supporters who work on a weekly basis at the reserve. And this year, they contributed to planting 8,000 seedlings for the South Shore Bluff Restoration Project. They held 51 volunteer work days, some for community members, some for groups like this, and then many of the ongoing Native Plant Patrol work days. Collected seed from 22 different native, native species for restoration, and then removed thousands of invasive plants, 19 um, targeted invasive species at Point Lobos. Um, Anna B has also helped with the management of the watering contract to support a restoration project. She's helped with the, the contract for invasive spraying and has done soil site monitoring and um, photo monitoring so that we can see how restoration is actually impacting the reserve long term. And then the other area in here is um, research. So we have continued our funding for research. So. 2018, we funded uh, the continuation of the Black Oyster Catcher Monitoring Project, which uh, before Point Lobos itself, many docents are involved in that project. Um, we completed a study of the health of the cypress stand at the A.M. Allen Memorial Grove, and then we began monitoring small mammal species composition and abundance in uh, the coastal prairies, both pre and post burn. So some of the highlights for um, natural resources this year. At the upper left, you'll see Julia Fields, who was our ecologist at the start of 2018 with the resource crew of state parks. In the center there, you'll see um, one of my favorite pictures because it shows just how many people are necessary to complete this work. So there's state park staff, there's docents, there's foundation board members, there's donors, <coughs> some of whom directly support the ecologist position. And there's community members. And that was a, a South Shore Bluff community planting day. And then at the right, we have a shrew. That's one <laughs> just kind of a cool picture that, um, that the researcher was very, very excited about because these apparently are not very common and this one was pregnant. And uh, in, in the center, I'm going kind of clockwise, in the center there is Pat Lovejoy planting seedlings in his new docent class, and it's impossible to acknowledge everybody who's helped with, with this work. And then at the lower left, of course, is the burn, and um, our ecologist helped with that. She was the one who was out at the reserve every day with the weather whirly gigs, checking the, the moisture and the, um, everything that was needed in order for parks and Cal Fire to have a successful burn. <clears throat> so, cultural resource protection. We have continued our support of the Whalers Cabin Museum, so things like rodent abatement and general maintenance of the cabin. And then this year we added uh, support for the collection. So we have always provided the security services so that people can be alerted if there's damage or break into the cabin, insurance on the collections that are held inside. And then this year we brought on an archivist, Mary Dwan, who is here somewhere. Mary, also over here. <laughs> Um, and she's helping to provide some really much needed structure to 
the collections it's, uh, to the collection process and to the collections themselves with the ultimate goal of enhancing interpretation. A lot of what is available or um, housed right now by the PLF and by state parks is not available to visitors. So the ultimate goal is to provide some more um, services to people through the interpretation of, of our archives. And a couple, um, one of the really fun things many of you have probably seen up at the left, um, the visitor card that A.M. Allen provided to people who entered Point Lobos when he owned the property that's asking them to be careful and protect the cultural and um, natural resources that are held inside. So this was in the late 20s prior to state parks taking it over. And then at the right you see uh, Mary working on some of our collections. So docent operations. Uh, we have, this is, this is really includes all of the administrative and kind of oversight, over, um, not oversight, but min, management and support fees for the docent organization. So things like the monthly trainings, the facility fees, the speaker stipends, the awards, the, um, the docent recognition events are all things that are supported by the foundation. Operating supplies, so the copy machine and, and uniforms all the communications tools, so the phones at the info station and at Whaler's Cabin and at the Docent Center, uh, the Docent website, which is a community building tool and also a scheduling tool, and then the monthly Docent newsletter are all things that are supported in that area. And then lastly is the accounting and reporting support. So all of the payment processing and all of the uh, reporting that we have to provide back to grantors who fund this work and um, record keeping, audit support, those kinds of things. And we know how critical this is, the dose and operations, because in 2018, the dose organization by itself gave 28,529 hours of service to Point Lobos. And I, I chose a couple of pictures that I thought just really highlighted the, the quality of volunteer service that's happening at Point Lobos. And that upper left, I believe, is class 41? 40. 40. Um, at the right is, I believe that's Dr. Roy leading a school walk and having more fun, potentially, than the students. And then at the lower left, um, some of the connections that are made through the um, Mint Van. So um, just a, an incredible um, group of docents who are supporting Point Lobos. So we move on to education and interpretation. Um, we have supported, in 2018, we supported four different school programs. So we provided the funding for transportation grants for Title I schools, uh, the outreach for the school programs, we provided support and equipment for the long distance learning program, the ports program, for junior lifeguards, and for summer adventures. And we, um, also provided grant support for uh, the easy access program so groups and facilities who have financial limitations were able to come in and experience this adapted interpretation um, program that's offered and then the last thing here is interpretive supplies so things like the scopes and the, the pelts and the stuffed squirrels and the brochures and the displays all of those different things that that um, docents need to to help bring the reserve to life for people and this is a, a really easy one to illustrate why we do it, and it's for the experience that we see on the left and, and acknowledging that not everybody has access to places like this. And without access to places like this, they, they, uh, it's hard to form a connection and a bond with the outdoor environment. So at the upper right, we have the Summer Adventures Program, the Mint Van, and at the lower right, the um, State Parks Interpreter, Daniel Williford, doing his interpretation of the kelp forest for a distance learning program. <laughs> okay, so alliances and partnerships. Um, it, it would be so, it's, it's very appealing to think that we could fulfill our mission by focusing only on what happens inside the boundaries of Point Lobos itself, but we have long since understood that we need to be involved with partners in the area, particularly around green space, traffic, transportation, and things like that. So this category includes our regional work. Uh, we are 
partners in the Lobos Corona Parklands Partnership. Um, we partner with Big Sur Land Trust, State Parks, Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District, who's here with us today, and um, really focusing on the preservation of parklands and open space between Carmel and Garapata. Um, this year, the focus is to open the San Jose Creek Trail for the first time to the public, bridging California State Parks and the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District, and the goal is to have that open in 2019. <clears throat> and then we are very involved with the Park It Initiative. So that initiative is, is to improve safe and equitable access to parklands while improving traffic safety and reducing congestion. And its ultimate goal is the whole corridor between Carmel and Big Sur, but we, as the Point Lobos Foundation, are primarily focused on the area at the, the north end of the scope. In 2018, we worked with a consultant group to um, do a robust traffic, parking, and visitor study at Point Lobos so that we could provide that information to the park at partners and, the, and help people understand how long people are staying for, where they're parking, where they're moving around, what are the busiest times, um, where are they coming from, where do they stay when they're in the community, if, if outreach is needed, where, where would that be most effective. And then we have continued our support of the Carmel Area State Parks General Plan, which is closer than it was last year, <laughs> but not yet complete. So um, I know Brent will touch on that. And then um, statewide engagement. So this really includes all of the time that we spend building and maintaining relationships, not only with the district, but also with our um, with State Parks headquarters and the Partnerships Office in Sacramento. And uh, we work with other organizations like the Point Lobos Foundation. So we've been able to develop really strong relationships with people across the state, and we can call on friends and colleagues and advisors when we need to which has been uh, tremendously helpful. So in, in 2018, I was engaged by the State Parks Partnership Office to facilitate three trainings about, around planning and partnership. And I was one of uh, the partners that was engaged to develop a new mandatory reporting form for the state to evaluate the effectiveness of nonprofit partners. <clears throat> And I want to start with the, the picture on the lower right here. Um, it's, a, it's a good illustration of why we can't work in a vacuum at the Point Lobos Foundation. So this is an illustration of a map that was created by State Parks in 2018. All of the red lines show the user-created trails from Highway 1 into Point Lobos. To effectively mitigate that kind of behavior and um, protect the resources there, the State Parks needs the support of Caltrans, it needs the support of the county, it needs the support of the Coastal Commission, it ultimately needs the support of the Highway Patrol so that there's somebody to enforce any kind of structure that's put in place along the highway. And this is a good example of why we remain actively engaged with regional efforts um, that, that ultimately impact point levels. On the left is a um, what was called a collaborative conversation that took place in Muir Woods when we, we went and participated in that with colleagues from the Tahoe District. So um, Muir Woods is a highly visited national monument. They implemented a reservation system in 2018, January or February. And um, the conversation was, you know, how do we deal with some of these impacts of high visitor use? What has the reservation system done for them? What have they learned? What what are potential solutions to areas that are impacted by high visitor use? And then at the upper right is me doing a training. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, so lastly, management in general. So this includes um, organizational capacity. So things like creating the work and the time it took to create the 2019 to 2023 strategic plan. It includes the articles of incorporation change and our update to the bylaws, which are also available online. Um, fun development, so things like member events. Last year we had 16 member events, and we need to do those so that we can continue to build relationships with people who ultimately support this work, and then our communications efforts. Then administration, pardon me. Administration includes things like uh, legal, human resources, all of the staff costs that are not directly related to a program, insurance for the organization, supplies, all of those different things. 
And so I highlighted a couple of member events for this. At the top was a mushroom a donor event that we did. At the bottom, one of the monthly guided walks. And then at the lower right is a, um, an ad. And oftentimes, Point Lobos is awarded you know, Best Park. Again, it was this year, Best Park. So we try to take opportunities like that with California State Parks and attach people back to the resource and the protection of the resource, not just visitation of the resource. And I want to talk, I want to touch on our staff um, now. So we have Anna Bennett, who is our restoration ecologist. Karen Cowdery is our finance person. In 2018, she worked part-time all year. Um, I am the executive director. Kenley Butler came on in uh, September of last year as the development director. Mary Dwan is our archivist, so she's a contract employee for a specific period of time. And then Tracy, of course, is our communications and events person and responsible for all of the, a, a lot of the work on the back end. So I want to say how grateful I am for this team of people and how hard that we work. piece here, the 2019-2023 the um, high-level vision and strategic plan goals are in your program, and we don't have time to look at all of those today, but I'd encourage you to read them and understand a little bit more about the direction of the organization. It's our intention to, to put the plan online, we just haven't been able to do it prior to the meeting, So, um, but the plan in, in more detail online. And then the last thing I want to, uh, actually not the last, second to last, um, I want to talk about the unaudited financials that are in your program. And a lot of, we've been getting a lot of questions through the grapevine about financial information, so I wish I had even more time to focus on this today. But there's a couple of things that I want to highlight for us. It's a very important year for us financially. So over the past five or six years, restricted assets and restricted donations have increased. They've increased a lot. Um, at the same time, unrestricted assets, which we use to offset program costs, so for example, 77,000 of the trails costs last year came from unrestricted assets. Um, about 50 of the docent costs last year came from unrestricted assets. Those assets have gone down. So we have less of a cushion than we've ever had. Um, and it's, it's a really important thing for us to rebuild. So this year, our focus you know, for fundraising uh, is really on rebuilding the core support for the organization, looking at sources of earned income. Um, and we've also had to be really critical of expenses for the first time, which is new for everybody. We used to, I, it, I think this is the first year that not every request that was made of the organization was actually funded. And that, that's been a challenge for people. But we've done that because we need to focus on our long-term sustainability. And um, we've done that in close collaboration with our partners at State Parks also. <clears throat> so the, the priorities for 2019 are our continued support of the core programs in all of these different areas, um, fundraising so that we can rebuild some of those um, unrestricted assets, and then projects include, so these are kind of the project highlights in the areas, um, support of a comprehensive natural resource management plan at Point Lobos that's taken directly from um, the general plan and will allow us to prioritize and be more effective in our support of natural resource, um, our, contrib our contributions to that. And then funding of a new seasonal forestry aid at Point Lobos, so there will soon be a new full-time seasonal uniformed person on the ground in Point Lobos, which is really exciting. Um, the information station remodel project, which I know many docents are especially interested in to enhance interpretation there. Um, continuing our support of the museum collections management and interpretation. And then lastly, supporting state parks in a historic use assessment of the Hudson House for potential public use. So um, we, we have been and will continue to be busy this year. Um, and before I turn it over to Kinley, I do I, I want to remind you that we will be here after the meeting um, to answer specific questions. We have a collection box inside available all the time. 
um, at the office to answer any questions you have as supporters and docents and, and members. And now I want to turn it over to Kenley Butler, who is our development director. So I'd like to start off today with a love story. Why not? Beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, this is a story of a boy from New Mexico who married a girl from Chicago, and they came to California on their honeymoon, and uh, they discovered Point Lobos for the first time. And the blue of the water, and the otters, and the trees, and trails, and craggy rocks <coughs> seduced them to moving permanently to the area a few years later after the birth of their first child. Uh, two daughters soon followed, and it was a family of five, and Point Lobos became the go-to place on the weekends for this family. Um, hiking on trails, uh, putting their feet in the water at China Cove, and most importantly, uh, taking family naps in the Toyota Trousseau wagon parked at Weston Beach. <laughs> Very relaxing for three little kids. Um, so the little baby in the backpack is now uh, a junior at a university studying biotechnology, and the two daughters are now uh, local Monterey uh, high school students. Uh, the mother is a docent in training. I think it's class 41, right? And the father, gray and grizzled, is <laughs> happily working for the Point Lobos Foundation. Um, you know, as I've gotten to know this community, I realize that all of you have stories, that any one of you could come up here and tell your own love story about Point Lobos. Because Point Lobos is a special place. So why did I start with a love story? Well, as Anna said, I'm the development director, and some people call this, you call development advancement, and some people refer to it as fundraising. I like to refer to it as philanthropy, and philanthropy comes from the Greek word philanthropia. Um, philos is loving, and anthropos is man. So uh, philanthropy is, it denotes kindness and loving mankind. And I'd like to think that all of us in this room are engaged in philanthropy, but also in philos lobos, the, lo the act of loving point lobos. <laughs> As Anna noted, our priority number one this year is to build operating support. Without operating support, none of the programs or projects that Anna just outlined would be possible. Operating support or unrestricted funding is the underlying foundation, the basis for all that we do. It provides for management and operations to ensure that we operate efficiently, ethically, and legally. Uh, thanks to your generosity, uh, we've seen restricted gifts go from 68,000 in 2013 to over 300,000 in 2018, and it's a, it's a great job and restricted gifts are needed for these specific programs, but it's the unrestricted gifts that we need for core support. So I began with a love story, and I'm going to end with a love story. Um, in the summer of 1934, a young landscape architect arrived at Point Lobos. Um, he was working on completing the plan for the new state reserve. Uh, George spent two years at the reserve in the Whaler's cabin with his wife Martha and their daughter Zabette. Uh, this was their home, and, but it was also his office. And it was from this, from the way there's cabin that he directed his restoration projects, rerouting roads, planning uh, permanent trails, and making Point Lobos into what it is today. Um, so he was a very busy man, but I can see that from these pictures that he had time to swing on swings, and climb trees, and play at the beach, and read to his daughter, and play with his daughter. Uh, it's another love story. Um, I wanted to end today with um, a video, a short video presentation featuring two of our community members uh, sharing some of their earliest memories of Point Lobos. And as you watch this, I encourage you to think about your own love story with Point Lobos. Why are you still engaged? Um, what did you see at first sight at Point Lobos? when I was 
about 10. And it was not too long after the state park system had taken over Port Lobos. That was in 1933. So it was sometime 19, late 93, probably 1934 when I went. And my family went on a picnic because we were interested in parks and all that sort of thing. And uh, we went down and spent the day and then we had a lovely time. My brother and I chased around the tide pools and then we took some of the little hikes down around what's now called Allen's Point and uh, looked at the wildflowers and the animals that were around and of course that beautiful shiny red and green plant that's all over the place. <laughs> and in fact, I even picked a little bouquet for it. That was a bad thing, because you're not trying to pick it. But I did it. I will leave it on my youth. In any event, the result, of course, was a great case of poison oak, which I had the next day and for the next week or two. <laughs> One of the earliest memories is it was a playground. Um, one of my friend's fathers was the ranger here, lived right in this cabin behind us, and uh, we used to come out to play with him. We'd bicycle out. Highway 1 at that time, maybe had one or two cars, it seemed like an hour on the highway, so it was safe to bicycle. And we'd spend all Saturday out here. We'd come out in the morning, bring a lunch with us, and head on back home usually around 4 in the afternoon. It was just, you know, doing the trails. The trails still exist today, just like they did then. There's a few new ones. We can go to beaches now that are closed off. China Beach used to be open, and we'd always go down to that beach. Uh, Gibson Beach was open. We also used to take inner tubes and go through the caves underneath uh, Bird Island. At that time, before the area had collapsed, and those were caves that went between Gibson Beach and China Cove. Superintendent for Monterey for California State Parks. Um, he has been in this district since 2016. He was the uh, district superintendent at Oceano Dunes prior to coming to Monterey, and he's been a great friend and supporter to the Point Lobos Foundation. Um, before I turn it over, I want to thank Brent for his support and for the support that he provides to us through the district staff and Sean James who has one of the most demanding jobs that I've ever seen in my life um, still manages to make us a priority and we work closely with a lot of other district staff with Melissa as the, the docent coordinator in her role for the docent group and and I often hear people talk in conversation about how parks is understaffed but I don't think that you really understand it until you get to see what these people are doing on a daily basis. And I've been fortunate enough to get to see that and to see the kinds of high level things that come in that all need attention, the 600 unread emails. And um, I just want to really thank our state park partners because they're doing a tremendous job with uh, not a lot of resources right now. Yeah, I just had to respond. I know our guest speaker had to go, but uh, you know there was this beautiful language that Abraham Lincoln uh, signed that said that uh, the uh, Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove will be open to the public and inalienable. Uh, it's part of our rights. Uh, it will last for all time. Uh, there was two paragraphs that put that into uh, the state park uh, to, that initiated the state park system. Uh, there was no paragraph on budget or <laughs> funding or personnel or how we're going to do that. And so when things continued uh, with no budget, uh, so, so comparatively, we're doing much better. So we have some budget. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, then the, then the federal government came in and, um, and uh, the Buffalo Soldiers came over and were able to protect those uh, special natural and cultural resources. Um, he also uh, mentioned uh, a really neat um, uh, uh, 
partnership. And that is between the government and, uh, and uh, more flexible and, and uh, in some ways uh, very relevant groups like uh, partners and foundations and things like that. And it's really neat to be in the proximity of the William M. Mott Junior Training Center that's just up the road here over in Pacific Grove. And William Penn Mott Jr. was our director, um, I have the exact dates here, from 1967 to 1974. And uh, he was this great visionary. And he, he built this training center because he really believed in state parks. He believed in a robust and well-trained, very well-educated, professional state park service. He believed in the civil service and the civil servant. But he was intelligent enough and had a vision that was broad enough to not only to not blame those individuals or, or be critical of those individuals for the shortfalls, but rather to see an opportunity for the idea that there needs to be something more flexible. The strong, robust, well-trained bureaucratic group also comes with all of its challenges. They're slow. They're slower to respond. They don't have the flexibility that um, uh, the partnerships have. And for that reason, he was instrumental in bringing on the California State Park Foundation. And it's in that spirit of that legacy and that vision of William Pimont Jr. that we continue today. And that model, if done properly, can be very, very beneficial. And we see it immediately in our area here in Fort Lobos, where we have a state park staff that is beleaguered, it is slow to refill positions. Uh, the budget is trending upward, so that's a positive thing, but it's slow. Not all these things just happen at once. And we rely so heavily on our partners and we're so thankful for that. And so it's kind of in the spirit of this area that, and, and in the idea that William Pimont Jr. had that, uh, that we continue this, this very productive relationship of having a well-trained professional staff, but also understanding that we do have limitations in reaching out to that. So I just wanted to echo what Anna said earlier about that, that being such a critical part of the success of this park. Um, you know, I was going to talk about a couple things. I know we're running a little bit late already, and I expected that. But I really want to encourage everybody to bring your questions, your comments up through the proper channels. <laughs> Anna and I are talking regularly. Sean is very accessible. We'll be happy to have further discussion and further debate. But the things I'm going to talk about are kind of at a high level. I don't. Um, it's going to take a few years to work these things all the way out. I don't think we're going to solve them in this room today. And so in the interest of time, um, I do want to just encourage everybody to bring your questions through those channels, through Point Lobos Foundation, and we'll continue to incorporate those and have those discussions. But I'm going to talk about some big things that, that might start a, uh, spark a long debate. And I know we have a full uh, agenda today. And a beautiful day. Who knows? Maybe we'll even get out in the parks this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but please, uh, but please, we're, we're, we're really, um, uh, we're, we've been encouraged. And uh, we've already kind of adapted some of our approaches based on comments that we received from this group and others. So we really do want to encourage folks to, uh, to please participate. Uh, just unfortunately for this presentation, time won't allow that. But we really have two big things to talk about um, uh, right now. Well, well three uh, regarding uh, staffing uh, being the third. But uh, the general plan update and the reservation system are the two big things that people are talking about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the general plan process is not moving as quickly as I would uh, have hoped, but I, I'm very encouraged by the level of participation. Uh, I know for some people this isn't uh, a laughing matter anymore. Uh, Steve Bachman uh, wrote a nice timeline and put some information together for me. Um, and I think this started in 2012. Uh, yeah, in 2012, we had our first workshop and scoping meeting. Um, and then we've uh, had outreach and public events about every year uh, since then. So I know it's a long time in coming. The good news is, if you remember looking at the last general plan that came out, we received a lot of great comments saying, well, it actually changed. It was a response to comments. We just had this back and forth discussion for years. It seemed like the needle started to move. We were all really encouraged by that. Because I think we were um, uh, doing a good job listening to, to people and incorporating that in the plan, we received a very robust set of uh, comments. Uh, initially, uh, working with our uh, contractor and our group up at headquarters, we were trying to identify 
the reasons that we had initially proposed these things. Since then, over the last few months, we've shifted into saying, why justify what we did if these substantial comments, things like parking west of the highway, things like circulation throughout the park, important things like designation of the park, where we were going to include them all in one designation. And if you remember that, it was going to be one giant park. What that means is one park unit. Uh, a lot of visitors don't understand you know, a park unit if you're walking from one border to another. But if you're going to do things like build parking lots, work with shuttles, fuel mitigation, you have to be very careful how you name and classify these things. And Carmel River State Beach is required, and it, it calls for us uh, running that much differently than the properties east of the highway. Um, and, and those things, with, with these ideas that we're trying to include those things, those, um, it, it began to be obvious that we needed to make those changes. And so for that reason, and I think it's a good reason, and I appreciate everybody's frustration, and I know that um, these delays continue to pile up, but, but for those reasons, we have delayed the, it was gonna go before the commission in April, and we've delayed that until October. Uh, the good news is we just got confirmation this week by everybody uh, from headquarters all the way down that we don't need to recirculate. What that means is taking a parking lot out here or there, um, keeping Carmel River State Beach designated as it is, in fact, a, a state beach, um, it doesn't require any substantial change to recirculate, but we will put the next and well, the final draft out, um, you know, within the 60 days prior to the October meeting. So you'll see that, and like I said last year, I know it goes year after year, but I think people will be very happy to see the thought that was put into traffic circulation, fuels management, and, uh, and some of the parking lots that may have been thought of, uh, that were kind of artifacts of a, of a thought back in 14 or 15, and as we started to evolve our thinking, um, bring that in. So for that reason, uh, it, it has been delayed, and I, I appreciate your patience with that, but I'm very uh, encouraged by uh, the, the changes that are made, and I think when uh, this comes out in August, uh, this, this next draft, and we have the 60 days to review, I hope that we uh, not only get more thoughtful comments, which we will again incorporate, uh, but we won't have to go out to recirculate but also that we'll get some support from, from the group so that uh, people can understand, the commission can understand that it's a well thought out uh, plan. It's taken us a long time to get here, but I think it was worth the journey. Um, and again, if you have other questions, please uh, go through Anna and her staff and we'll be happy to address those. The next thing is the reservation system, and that is a lot newer and a little bit, um, a little bit different of an approach. Uh, Whereas the general plan, we, we thought this through, and by the time I arrived in 2016, we had to look for any fatal flaws, and, and we did see some. Um, at this point, the, the shuttle system is at a point where we're in the information gathering phase. This is something that when I got here two and a half years ago, a small group started to talk about it, and there was real debate. And, and, and now, although there are obviously differences of opinion, there's an overwhelming majority. Any room I go into, any group I talk to, any uh, homeowners association or uh, allied agency, uh, coastal commission, those folks, people are really coming along to the idea that the shuttle system is a great idea. It doubles in the details and it's gonna take a long time, but the shuttle slash reservation system kind of go hand in hand. And people wanna know where we are on that. We have, we're starting to really narrow our focus, but the, um, the answer to that question is we're in the information gathering phase still. We're still looking at reservation companies, we're still looking at what the uh, shuttle options are, and we're looking at those locations. As we start to kind of get a 30 or 40% idea of what we can offer and get everybody a starting off point, we'll start going out for public comments so that we're not doing the same thing we did in the general plan where we're making uh, gross changes near the end, but rather we start to kind of have this idea of how it'll work for everybody involved, uh, especially the visitors, um, uh, when, when we get to a point where we get to that 60-70% plan that will uh, really provide great access to the park, it'll allow us to manage our visitor use, and it'll also enable the public who's coming from a long way away to know if and when they're going to have an opportunity to visit the park in the way that it was intended, uh, to enjoy the, 
pristine natural cultural resources. So um, those are the, the two big ones. Uh, Anna also asked me to uh, talk about staff, and we do have uh, some staff here, uh, former staff, Chuck, will, Ranger Chuck will be honored later, and also um, Steve Bachman, uh, current staff, it will be honored, and uh, we're really thanking you guys for the recognition for that. Um, they're doing a great job, and uh, Sean James has also been mentioned. Another person that we brought on in the last 12 months was Matthew Allen, and uh, he is the senior environmental scientist. So for those of you that are confused, like, I thought Steve Bachman was doing that. The answer was he, he the answer is he was doing that. <laughs> he was doing that and his other job and about four other things too. So now we have um, somebody that we can go to and we can um, uh, pinpoint so that when we're bringing on folks on the environmental side, they have a point of contact that's dedicated to that important work that isn't being taken out on, on other projects and that uh, Matthew's been doing a great job organizing and coordinating things. Uh, one thing that doesn't apply directly to Point Lobos, but he had this idea of a uh, volunteer uh, plover monitoring group. And uh, you know, it's a change, it was a new idea, and it kind of was met with resistance. Uh, but uh, just last week we had a meeting, uh, oh, it was two weeks ago now, uh, but uh, we had a meeting, and there's 12 people that are interested in volunteering, uh, being trained, you know, and, and volunteering to be snowy plover monitors up in our northern beaches. And uh, so these are just these kind of great ideas that Matthew brings uh, with him, and uh, we're really happy to have him along. Uh, he, he really understands the importance of the relationship with state park staff, the staff that Point Lobos Foundation is bringing on, coordinating all of these different efforts, and uh, I'm really happy to have him on board. Uh, additionally, we have a new forester position. We don't know when that's going to be advertised, but a forester is a pretty high level uh, person, obviously focused on the forest, and will be helping out with Big Sur. But what uh, we're all very interested in this area is fuels management, and that will be a big portion of their position, especially fuels and urban or, or developed interface, where we have properties that are interfacing those things. So uh, hopefully, we'll have that position here in the next um, six to 12 months. Um, another little change, but uh, um, we had some Fish and Wildlife funding for Daniel Wilford. Uh, Daniel is uh, such a great asset to the, the area, the Point Lobos area specifically. Uh, although some of the funding has sunsetted, we have absorbed his costs at the district uh, level. So we will <laughs> Pass that along. Um, and, and then another staff, you know, uh, again, going back to the bureaucracy and, and the state system is slow to evolve, but we have a really big uh, vision and we have big ideas for the Point Lobos area. Uh, but they are uh, realized through incremental and very slow uh, progress. Uh, Sean James uh, really did a great job. We, we advertised a position for a supervising ranger, we, and we take that position very seriously. They supervise seasonals, they interface with all of our partners, and uh, they bring in the staff. And sometimes a bad supervisor can push out staff. Um, and we had a round of candidates that were pretty good, uh, but they weren't good enough uh, for this area. And we went back out and we, uh, we reached out to some people. I worked uh, with this uh, individual in 2006 and seven, and uh, he has a lot of character and integrity. And I think you guys are really gonna enjoy working with uh, Marcos Ortega, who was the successful uh, candidate on our second round of uh, interviews, and he starts Wednesday. So oh, that's, that's great. And then we have a ranger, Jake Williams, who as soon as he got here, uh, we, were, we were both uh, excited to see him, and, and then uh, he went out on a, a bit of maternity leave, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, he's starting a family here, uh, loves the area, and we're hoping he puts down roots because uh, we saw him briefly for about a month before the maternity leave started. And, uh, and he comes with well recommended uh, from another part of the state. And then uh, Marcos, as a supervising ranger, is going to have a little bit of an opportunity to work with our other supervising lifeguard in shaping a new uh, peace officer lifeguard that we'll have out there from the academy. And they'll be starting in July. So 
Uh, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, and it's neat to see this, this vision that we're about 30% to where I, when I arrived in 2016, I kind of had an idea of where I wanted to see, uh, see us, and we're about 30% of the way there, which is good because um, we, were, we were really bare bones a while ago. So um, seeing Marcos come in, provide some good leadership, seeing some of these full-time employees come in, seeing people like uh, Daniel come under a purview of a district budget, and also you remember last year uh, we brought Melissa in for a full-time, fully funded position. Um, those are those are the things that we're doing. And it's just nice to kind of recognize, look back, and go, wow, 12 months ago we were here, and although it takes a while, each and every month, at the end, um, at the end of this year, we're we're at a, uh, at a really good spot for personnel. Um, and lastly, I just want to give you an update on what I've been up to, uh, specifically how it applies to this group. But the department director came out and was very interested in traffic and circulation. Uh, Jack Ainsworth, the executive director of the Coastal Commission, was out a few weeks after that. And then later we had Coastal Commissioner Carol Groom, who kind of went through this area quickly and then spent some time uh, down in uh, Big Sur. We talked a little bit about fuels management. but. Um, and, and then we also have had one sustainable corridor transportation. The reason I mention all of those meetings is because at every one of those, I had a moment to have them to myself and to talk about specifically the Point Lobos Foundation and how great they have been and how nice they are to work with and what a conduit they are for the community involvement. And then when I come forward with things like uh, solutions for transportation or changes in park management or, or possibly looking at how this reservation will change visitation and level out uh, from our peaks to, to the off season. How I can say that with confidence that this isn't just a state park idea, this is a grassroots idea that's roundly supported, not only by the immediate people in the area and by the park, but also by the visitors. And we owe it to them for safe and equitable access into the state parks. And also talk about some of the, um, uh, the school groups, some of the ways that we can offset funding for some of the disadvantaged groups that fill out forms and that qualify. And those are, uh, those are those details that are gonna move these processes along to help us manage um, parks, uh, specifically Point Lobos, in a more sustainable way. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know publicly what I've been saying to each of these people privately uh, over the last couple of months as they've come out and visited the park. And uh, it's been very well received. So. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for being a partner with State Parks. We really appreciate the relationship we have. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. So we're getting now to the awards, which is always a really special um, part of the annual meeting. And, uh, I want to um, start with um, the first, with a new award for the foundation. So um, we have talked, you know, at our heart, we are an organization who relies on partners every day. You know, a lot of what we do is raise money and then distribute it back out and, and help um, partners at times um, with project management, report to funders, but everything that we do relies on partners. We don't operate anything inside Point Lobos. We don't operate any volunteer work, very little bit. Um, and we rely on partners. And so the, uh, the, the mo movement over the past several years at California State Parks as a whole has really been towards embracing partnerships ever since the Parks Forward report was put out and all of these different changes have been made. And it's wonderful, it's an authentic movement. But I think in many ways, Parks is still structured in a way that makes it a lot easier for partners to say no to new and novel ideas than it is to say yes. And so we're fortunate in this district that we have partners who believe in us and will try different things and will support us in trying different things. But you know, State Parks is a big, it's a bureaucracy, it's a big organization. And and those um, those people who say yes and try new things are really important and valuable for us. So 
We created the Excellence in Partnership Award. It's not always, it's, it's um, able to be awarded to anybody that we partner with. Um, this year is the inaugural award and we are presenting it to Steve Bachman. I want to talk a little bit about him. But um, it's, it's really the intent is, for, is to honor and recognize a partner of the Point Lobos Foundation who's gone above and beyond the call of duty to further our mutual goals. Recipients must be engaged in a partnership and will have demonstrated innovative, collaborative, and creative approaches to the partnership that paved the way for greater shared success. And so of all of our partners, we rely most heavily on California State Parks. And um, I got to begin working with Steve when he was the, um, a senior planner and the acting senior environmental scientist for the Monterey District. Um, he's currently a senior planner, but we worked, we worked most closely together when he was serving in the environmental scientist role, um, a position he held from 2012 to 2018. And I can say that it was his vision and his collaboration that really paved the way for the natural resource support that we provide to Point Lobos today. So it was his vision and acceptance of us as a partner to say, hey, we can work together on a research program. And a research program is important, and then we can take that data and, and get deferred maintenance money, 300,000 to do a restoration project, and then we can pave the way to have an ecologist so that we can do more out there that's directly, that has a direct link to uh, California State Parks and active management by California State Parks. Um, so his commitment to Point Lobos and to working with us as partners has made a, a lasting impact on the organization. Most importantly, I think it's going to continue benefiting Point Lobos for many years. And um, I, I want to say that Steve and I became great friends over our time working closely together. And if you've not ever seen him interact with, at Point Lobos with volunteers or with uh, visitors, then you really are missing out because he has this genuine, childlike, deep love of this place that so many of us share. And he gets passionate. He gets passionately mad, and he gets passionately happy, and passionately appreciative, and um, has this unbridled energy that um, is really important. And I, I want to say that it's a joy for us to be able to acknowledge you today, and welcome you. came back to the district here in Monterey, uh, and I had the, the, just the wonderful privilege of meeting Anna. And when I first came back, um, one of my old professors started up the Watershed Institute um, at CSUMB, Bob, Professor Bob Curry. And so I reconnected with them immediately and came up with some harebrained ideas of, hey, why don't we do some graduate research? Because I had been talking to headquarters in the state parks, and they were saying, well, Steve, you know what you're saying, it's all great and dandy, but where's your data? You don't have any data supporting what you're saying. So I went to Anna, and I said, hey, what about forming a graduate research program? And I, she said, well, give me some ideas and some projects. So I typed up a sheet of paper, and literally, this is the beauty of partnerships. Five days later, Anna said, Okay, we got $100,000, let's go. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. Okay, so like we were saying earlier, you know, government doesn't really work that quick, right? So, so I'm, I'm scrambling to uh, get this thing going and working with Anna, really closely with Anna on that. So 
Um, you're, you're terrific. I, I've worked at a lot of different agencies and a lot of different partnerships, and I gotta say the foundation is by far, um, it's the model that everybody should strive and try to reach and be because it's just phenomenal. Um, it's such a pleasure working with all the foundation uh, staff, all the volunteers. Um, I gotta give a shout out to all the volunteers and the docents who worked on the South Shore Bluff Restoration Project. Because if I remember correctly, you guys should, you guys should stand up. Because, um, you, 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 Julia Fields told me that I believe it was 13,000 hours equivalent of all the time that the docents and volunteers put into the South Shore Bluff Restoration Project. And without you, it would not it would have been much more difficult um, in terms of uh, achieving those restoration goals and those objectives. So uh, big thanks to all the volunteers and the docents for doing all that phenomenal work and real fun to work with too. A lot of joking around, but we always, you gotta have fun. You know, <laughs> Um, and then, of course, I just wanted to mention, you know, Marsha Grand um, was a big supporter of this from the beginning, so I wanted to recognize her and give her a special shout out. Um, I haven't met her yet, but I'm hoping I can meet her someday. Phenomenal. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what else here. I know Chuck wants some of my time, so. <laughs> you said we only had three minutes, so I said, okay, I'll give you a couple, you know, minutes for a few hundred thousand bucks. So. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's just been real great. I, 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 we're working on it, like Brent said, we're working on a general plan, and um, we received a lot of really good comments, and we take those comments very seriously, and we really read them carefully, and the plan is going to be a good plan. You know, in large part because of all the comments that we did receive, so that's excellent. And, and a planner's opinion, it's, that's what it's all about, right? Um, and then we had the interns. We, we had a phenomenal group of graduate interns, starting with Sean Noble and his report, looking at all the uh, trails in terms of the erosive indexes and um, along the South Shore and North Shore. That report is what triggered Jay Chamberlain, our Director of Natural Resources, to say, hey, well, you better get that higher up on your PID list for funding. And so we did, we put it on the top priority and it was funded the same year, wow. to the tune of $325,000. So it just shows you, they were telling me, hey, where's your data? Well, we got the data, and boom, we, we got the money pretty quickly. And so that was nice. And then we worked with um, Eric Stanek, Elizabeth Koch. I think we're, next week we'll be interviewing the seventh Eighth potential intern. Right. I'm trying to try, I was trying to remember when all this started. Was it 20, 2013? 13. Oh, time flies. Ooh. That's a little scary. But um, <laughs> yeah, so the, and the graduate internship program. So it was a three way partnership really between us, the foundation, and CSUMB. And CSUMB really stepped up, and they're, they're, the level of graduate students <laughs> um, pretty impressive. Yeah. So anyway. With that, thanks so much. Yes, so Steve chose one of Chuck Bancroft's images. Oh. Yeah. And uh, a beautiful one. I chose this photo because my father, when he used to take me out to Point Lobos, you know how Bird Island has this, the flat area where all the birds nest? He always told me that's where a castle used to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we we usually have our awards um, beautifully framed by now, but the excellent craftsman framer that Chuck um, engages on our behalf has 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 had hand surgery, so we are we're taking those back to have them framed as he recovers. <laughs> So next, I, our next award goes to somebody who really needs no introduction and um, deserves a lot more than 10 minutes of introduction, but I want to welcome Reed Woodward. Reed has been a host for many years and was the inaugural recipient of the Gen 
Jed Vandeveer Lifetime Achievement Award, which is the highest award that the foundation bestows upon people and has agreed to present for Chuck today. I'd like you to come up here. <laughs> While I do this, it's going to be short. <laughs> what <a> word. <laughs> On this side, over here. I'm going to keep you away from the microphone. <laughs> Chuck and I uh, both started working at Point Lobos in 1981. Our hair used to be brown. <laughs> it seems like we've done a thousand school programs together. And uh, Chuck always threw himself into the next walk or program or whatever had to be done. It was kind of here, there, and everywhere. And instead of Chuck, uh, we be began to call him Runamuck. <laughs> Charles M. Bancroft he was born in San Francisco, and as many of you know, has a twin brother. This is kind of a. <laughs> He also has a degree, you know, there's been so many write-ups of you in this. I'm going to, uh, he has a degree from Santa Rosa in forest technology and another degree from Sonoma State in environmental studies. And regional planning. And regional planning. <laughs> Just minor in the doctor. He joined State Parks in 1973 and worked at a number of parks before transferring in January of 1981 to Point Lobos. Living there for a time, which always fascinated us, in the whaler's cabin. And after coming to Point Lobos, like so many terrifically intelligent rangers, he didn't transfer anywhere else <laughs> anymore. Rarely, has one person created such a presence <laughs> over his years at Point Lobos. One that incorporated uh, formality when needed, uh, for heads of state, that kind of thing. Uh, warmth and friendliness. You, in that Dodger hat, take it off or you leave the reserve. <laughs> He uh, has an extensive knowledge of local history, I'm being serious now, and, and natural science as well as a respect and obvious delight in interpreting and caring for this treasure of the state park system, Point Lobos. He can still see with the eyes of a child. Even after he retired in 2011, he couldn't stay away. I think Paul Reps put it best by saying, you know, we can't miss you if you never leave. <laughs> behind the scenes with his camera, doing private walks, shouting from the rear of the docent meetings, <laughs> and a hundred other duties about which, thankfully, I am sworn to secrecy. <laughs> so I just want to add a little poem here, um, because uh, Point Lobos is poetry friendly, which I think is wonderful. There once was a ranger named Chuck 
who wandered to Point Lobos by luck. He was so smart and useful, he got jobs by the snootful. <laughs> but he is happiest when running amok. <laughs> Um, Chuck is one of the people that actually worked with Judd Vanderveer for a number of years and over many years at the Reserve. And I, I just can't help but think that Judd is uh, pleased that Chuck's receiving this Lifetime Achievement Award in, uh, award in uh, Judd's name. So, Congratulations. I'm, I'm going to go and get the photograph that you made for yourself. <laughs> just, just hold it over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I'm going to just hold it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a phone book? No. <laughs> the old veteran Cypress in the fog. My wife Cheryl and I picked it out together. <laughs> there was a joke going around about what photograph we would choose. <laughs> anyway. I was just flabbergasted, and then I went in to tell Cheryl, and I started to cry. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I might even do that now. But we got to talking about the three minutes that Jim allowed me <laughs> to talk and what I would do. And so Cheryl said, you need to pick maybe three things and focus on those. And then not broaden out, but you know, keep it focused. And over these last few weeks, I've been thinking about that, and I just came up with one. And it's teamwork, and it takes a village. And the transitions and passing things on. And I think back to the Point Lobos Advisory Committee, and it was made up of people that are well known in this community. Bert Yaden of the PG Museum, Judd Vandeveer, Earl Mosier, Courtney Matthews, John Hudson, and Dr. John Davis from the Hastings Reservation. And from that transition in the 70s, going to the very first board of directors of the Point Lobos Natural History Association, Pat Hughes was the chairperson, educator, Salinas School District. <coughs> Ferdinand Ruth, professor, UC Berkeley, and then down here. Paul Larson, Bob Culberson, Larry Moore, Jim Fife, Steve Barnett, Park Rangers, Point Lobos, and their wives, Judy Moore, Janice Fife, and then Fran Siesla, who some of us really know and love, passed away a number of years ago, great student at UC Santa Cruz, and the artwork behind the Point Lobos brochure. And then I think of where it went from there. And Rod Parsons starting the DOSA program, with the foundation being the major supporter of that. And then going on from there, you see Jerry Loomis and Glenn McGowan and I getting to Point Lobos all within eight months of each other, and then staying together for the next 22 years. And Jerry taking ideas that were formed and creating the dive program and becoming the dive master for the entire state of California. He started with a teacher the Adopt-a-School program, and look where that's gone now with the funding from the association to bring school groups in, and the docents going out to the school groups to do presentations beforehand. I look at the original fern dealers at Point Lobos, and we had one ranger that all he did was make charts of all the different plants and things like that, who said he would never get married and couldn't believe it when I was getting married. <laughs> and then going down to the desert and continuing his flowers, 
and getting married and having two daughters. <laughs> I think about the organization of the third grade program starting in 1991 when Glenn was at the First Presbyterian Church and was sitting with Alice Bleasner who said, we just got a grant at River School to improve the social studies program and more about the community. And what can you do about that to help us? So Glenn came back and with Cheryl sitting in on it, we started brainstorming, and we came up with the third grade River School program, which eventually expanded out into four different third grade programs. And some of that program is still going on now, even though the original people aren't there anymore. I think about the beginnings of the seventh grade outdoor ed program with the Carmel Middle School. And again, sitting down with a group of people, including Cheryl, and coming up with what we wanted to do with that. And after I left it, Kevin Grady is still carrying on that tradition. I think about those fern feelers again, and what little we did then, and then looking at what now Anna's doing, and what Katie's doing with all the volunteers, and that program continuing and continuing. The Adopt-A-School program continuing and continuing. I think about the work that went into the 75th anniversary party that we had. We had a different big event every Saturday in the month of May, and it couldn't have been done without all the volunteers that participated in that. The different docent interest groups that have carried on and carried on and carried on work that's being done that we started in little minute fashions that are really big things right now. One of the unsung heroes of Point Lobos, who's not doing it anymore, but is with the Fern Feeler group now, and a big participant, is Pat Lovejoy. Back in the day, Pat was an avid diver at the reserve and had his own patrol boat, and we put stickers on the transom so he could go out and contact the illegal fishermen and the illegal divers and all that, and an unpaid supporter of everything that we were trying to do. So thank you, Pat. <laughs> and then I think about the relationship between state parks and the foundation and the docents and how extraordinary that really is. And I look at what we used to call the golden years at Point Lobos. There were about 20 years there with Larry, Larry, Gary, <laughs> Glenn, Jerry, and I working with management that let us get away with murder. <laughs> and we couldn't have done the things that we did without the support of Mary Wright. Mary, are you still here? Yeah. There she is. Mary Wright was our, our district superintendent through those golden years. And we wouldn't have been able to accomplish what we did without her support and Paula Peterson, our chief ranger. And now I see Sean and, and Brent carrying that tradition on. And I first met them when they were just little field rangers. Back in the day. <laughs> and now I see them and the transitions that they've made and what they're doing with the foundation and with the docents now. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. So the one thing I'll always remember is from those first days when the docents were in their training and graduated on February 7th, 1981. 2781. 2781. One of the first docents in the group who was our mentor, Sister Anna Boss. <laughs> and what she told us, pass it on, pass it on, pass it on with wonder. Thank you. Woo.
it just is, I find it so inspiring. I mean, the fact that, that these organizations have worked in partnership for so long and have done so many really outstanding things with so much potential to do such, so much more in the future. So I want to thank Steve and I want to thank Chuck for, um, for, the, for the inspiration that you all have given us and continue to give us and the fact that you still stay very involved in our lives um, and in the work of the organization, so thank you. Um, and in that, yes, thanks. And in that spirit, um, I also have the pleasure of being able to give out a few awards. As many of you know from previous annual meetings, it's been the tradition of Point Lobos Foundation. Um, long practice to acknowledge board members who have ended their service during the previous year and to thank them for their contributions to the organization. We have um, several board members uh, who uh, ended their service this year who were not able to be with us today. But I would like to um, call the two who are here up today to uh, come up and let me um, acknowledge and give them their awards. So Sue and Karen, will you come up? serving on the board of the foundation. They have been docents and they do in both capacities, have done and continue to do <coughs> remarkable things. Um, in their capacities as board members, they made many valuable contributions to the foundation. Um, but I'd like to highlight today a few of those that I think for them and certainly for my experience <coughs> working with them really has stood out. And what connects those experiences is the passion that both Sue and Karen have for both natural and cultural resources protection at the reserve. I think you all know that they carry that as a very, very strong set of values and very big time commitments that they've made. So I want to, um, and, and also to recognize that always in their minds, there's the partnership between the foundation and state parks and the docents, um, which is what, as many people have said today, and always bears repeating, is what makes us so successful. So I'd like to start with Sue, alphabetical order, um, and she's right here. So um, Sue first served on the board as an elected director, and then also stayed on the board uh, when she subsequently transitioned to her role, uh, to role as a docent administrator, administrator of the docent organization. Um, among, every, among a number of other things Sue brought to the board um, was that she served as essentially our first natural and cultural resources, particularly natural resources at that time, liaison between PLF and state parks. In that capacity, um, her ecological experience and the vision about partnerships made her instrumental in helping get started the CSUMB um, Natural Resources Intern Research Project that Steve mentioned and that Anna has mentioned and that has produced so much incredibly valuable resource research that importantly is being used to support resource management decisions and actions of the reserve. That's translating the science into action. Um, sometimes the science sits on the shelf, sometimes actions get done without scientific basis, but here we're really marrying those two. And Sue saw the vision, shared it with Steve and Anna, and we have a lot to thank them for on that. Um, in addition, she was also deeply involved in the South Shore Restoration Project. Um, she, is, she was out there, as I recall, in Tybex suits uh, as well, yeah. with the um, invasive control species even during the period when we were basically the ones doing it, you know? Um, and um, she also was part of the visionary, and that will be shared with other people, around the need to also see value of protecting our cultural resources and including things like museum artifacts and archives which Anna mentioned as part of the museum collection program. Um, 
Most of all, what Sue Brain brought, and as you know who have worked with her, she brings a very unique sense of humor. Um, and, um, and, it, and it always leavened our board meetings, and it always enabled us to have new insights and new perspectives because of the way she brought in her counsel and vision. So Sue, thank you very much for all you contributed. the South Shore Restoration Project, the Native Plant Patrol, the hiring of our resource um, restoration ecologists, both the first and the second, um, and in addition to um, initiating this new project that Anna mentioned around uh, the museum archives and collections. So Karen carries that natural and cultural resources protection hat all the way, as does Sue, and I can vouch for the fact that it's not just the organizational and management pieces or the planning pieces or the you know intellectual pieces. They have been out on the ground for years, whether it's doing invasive species control or digging and replanting plants or managing hydrants for the water. So Karen, I want to thank you also. <laughs> Lobos and for the members um, uh, coming up. That's Anna, Kenley, 
Karen, Mary, and Tracy. So I hope that you as members will, I'd be grateful if you would acknowledge both the, um, um, the staff and the directors, don't need to get up, but just um, we thank you. So this brings us to the end of the program, Anna. Oh, there we go, there's the thank you. Oh, no, can I do, oh, every time I do that, it doesn't do the right thing. So just to, uh, to close the program, um, I want to encourage all of you again, if you haven't already shared your love at first sight stories with Kenley and Tr uh, Tracy, please do so. Um, there are going to be some fabulous stories coming out, and you of all people have love at first sight stories that I know that you can share, so please do that. Um, in addition, just as a reminder, Brent, um, well, Brent, are you going to be able to stay for a little yes. while? Okay, Brent, Sean, Anna, Kenley, and I will all be staying up here after the meeting. We encourage anyone who has uh, questions they want to ask or anything they want to share to come on up at um, that point. Um, but I will close by saying thank you again for all that all of you do to support the Point Lobos Foundation. I think you've heard today that we have accomplished much at the Reserve um, this year, um, and that includes also significantly strengthening PLF's organizational capacity to do more in the future. We can all, I think, be very proud of these accomplishments, um, very proud. Um, we recognize that we have big opportunities, though, to do much more. So uh, with your help, we can look forward to sharing even more impressive success stories in the coming months and the years. So my thanks to all of you as members for your support, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you again for coming. Have a great, gorgeous day.